All right, hello everyone. Up next, we have returning presenter, Lindsay Hurt. She studies marine biology with a focus on whales and she has prepared a great presentation for us today. Lindsay, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, before I get started, I do wanna give you a quick disclaimer. I am recording live, well, actually not recording. I'm just live um, from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And here on Cape Cod, we are currently having, sorry, a dog that is squeaking too many toys. <laughs> and also um, some pretty bad weather. Um, there's a flash freeze in effect right now, and um, I may or may not lose power. So just in the spirit of excitement and sometimes um, not knowing what's going to happen, um, there's a possibility I may get cut off. So I just wanna let everybody know, and I'm praying with my fingers and toes crossed that that doesn't happen. Um, in the meantime, Welcome. Um, I am really happy to have everyone here and I'm totally enjoying uh, the fact that this is not my first presentation with National Biodiversity Teach-In. I love being here with all of you and it's just so great that everyone gets to share, uh, discuss and be part of some really excellent science that's going on. So with that, I am going to share my presentation with everybody and I will reserve some space for you all if you would like to perhaps ask questions throughout. Um, I'll see if I can direct them right away. If I am not able to answer them right away, then I will make sure that at the end of my presentation, I definitely uh, address all of your questions. So thanks for jumping aboard. So today my presentation is called Whale Tales on Cape Cod. Kind of a little bit like tales, like whales, uh, but also tales like stories. I really wanna hear from all of you who know anything about whales, who have um, seen whales before, if you've studied whales, um, if you've watched them on television, if you've seen them in person, I would love to hear about that um, because I have spent my entire life, literally my entire life since I can remember, thinking about and loving and celebrating whales. Um, and if you're just joining in now, once again, my name is Lindsay Hurt. I'm a marine biologist and science educator uh, from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And I welcome you to this presentation. So my first question for everybody, and feel free to throw them into the chat if you would like. I know there's a lot of classes out there today that are participating and watching together. I'd love to know have you ever seen a whale? Uh, this picture was actually taken this past summer in uh, August with some students in Gloucester, Massachusetts, um, pretty close to where I'm at right now, Cape Cod. And these are two of some of our favorite whales. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about uh, how we know who the whales are today. So if you have ever seen a whale or you have been in a whale watch or even been to a place like SeaWorld where they have um, some whales in captivity, I would love to hear about that and, and tell me what you think. This was on a commercial whale watching vessel and all the students who are with me got to lean right over the bow of the boat and uh, see these animals. So my favorite place to watch whales happens to be, of course, in the wild where they can live and act like animals naturally. And the best place to do that around here where I'm from uh, is out of Cape Cod. So I'm not gonna show a map today, but I do encourage you all to look up Cape Cod, Massachusetts if you're not familiar with the area. It is an amazing place. And it just so happens to be one of the top 10 whale watching hotspots in the entire world. Uh, the picture that you see featured here is of my favorite whale watching vessel to go out and work on. It is called the Tales of the Sea. And I wanna give a shout out to my friends at Captain John Boats of Plymouth, Massachusetts, who are graciously able to host me on this vessel and watch whales from their deck. So one of the most interesting things about Cape Cod, Massachusetts is that you can find whales off the coast uh, in a beautiful, amazing space called the Stellwagen Bank. Stellwagen Bank is actually uh, classified as a national marine sanctuary. There are 14 big watery areas um, all across the uh, American federal waters that are classified as a sanctuary. And uh, what makes them so special is that they're an amazing hotspot for a lot of biodiversity, many different types of animals, plants, and other organisms that either 
live here all year round or that may migrate to the area. And, and there's reasons for that. It's a really special place that happens to have a really unique mixture of environmental factors that allow for great sunlight and great nutrients um, to bring a really productive food area for these animals uh, and, and plants to live really, really well. And of course, as you can see, one of the most exciting things to enjoy uh, off the coast of Cape Cod in Stellwagen Bank are the whales. So what is a whale, really? Um, today's presentation is not gonna get too scientific or too nitty gritty into the details. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look um, just sort of at the basic characteristics of what a whale is and how we, we look for them and how we identify them. So if you know what a marine mammal is, you can go ahead and just throw right in the chat or in the comments, what do you think a marine mammal is? So one of the things that I enjoy um, seeing about marine mammals is that they actually are so very different from each other. I've listed some examples here. Of course, we have our whales that live in the water all the time. Um, dolphins and porpoises, which you probably expect would be a marine mammal, a mammal that lives in the water. Um, but there are some other ones that you might not really expect or think about too readily, um, such as the walrus or the sea otter, or even the polar bear or seals. A lot of these types of animals, they really don't look much like a whale, um, but they are classified as marine mammals. And the reason why is because they do spend a large part of their life in the water. Not every marine mammal actually does need to live in the water all the time or be what we call fully aquatic, swimming and hanging out in the water. Um, some of them can come up on land. And so the walruses, sea otters and polar bears are really, really good examples. If you happen to know uh, what some of these mammals might have in common with mammals on land, I'd love for you to throw some ideas into the chat there. I'm not gonna look at it yet because I'm sharing my screen with you, but I do wanna check out what some of your answers are and see if we can talk a little bit more about those later. So another way to further classify whales and dolphins the fact that they're a marine mammal is to explain a little bit more about how, uh, how they separate their characteristics. So we call all whales and dolphins cetaceans. Um, this is under the classification, those of you who are um, perhaps in high school or college and you're studying how we sort of organize uh, where we place uh, animals, plants, and other living things based on their characteristics, you would call all whales and dolphins cetaceans under the order cetacea. That means that they are these large bodied organisms that um, eat an awful lot of food and they live a fully aquatic lifestyle. And also they are pretty much obligate carnivores, whereas they're, they're trying to eat, they're trying to eat the meat, they're trying to eat animals. Um, they're further organized into two other groups that we call suborders, um, the mysticidae and also the odontocidae. So for those of you who may be studying Latin or know some word roots, you might know that the word mysticide means a mustache. So when we think of a mysticide whale, we think of someone who has, um, instead of teeth, they have um, a filter feeding mechanism in their mouth, and that is called baleen. If you know what baleen is, shout out. I would love to hear from you. So my favorite baleen organism is the humpback whale, which you see here. And if you can see me in the little box in the corner, here's my example of that same kind of whale that you see in the picture. That's a really up close view of, uh, of a humpback whale, actually a humpback whale named Owl. And uh, she's coming towards our stopped boat uh, with her mouth wide open because she's just taken in a whole bunch of fish. And if you look inside that mouth, which is it's articulated or jointed, you can see along the upper jawline, like so sort of where like where our upper teeth are. And you can see this sort of like fuzzy looking, sort of hairy looking plates that hang down. And those are the baleen. When the mouth slams shut over all the food that these whales are gulping into their mouth, what happens is the water just squirts out right between those plates and all of the little fishes or plankton or whatever type of item or food choice that the whale has chosen to eat um, get stuck behind and then they scrape it off with their tongue. So that is one 
word or one mechanism that we use to describe the mysticity as filter feeders. They filter their food. And that works great because whales, like the one that you see in the picture here, are typically going to be really, really big, like school bus big, 40 or even 50 feet long. And so it's not really going to work out too well for them to eat perhaps just one fish at a time. So there's another uh, particular group uh, that we look at for different kinds of whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and those are called the odontocetes. So if you've ever had to go get braces or get your teeth straightened or get a retainer, you may have had to go to the orthodontist, and that word root is daunt, and that means teeth. And I'm willing to bet some of you have heard of some of these uh, types of odontocetes before. Uh, there are many different types of odontocetes that come to visit the area that I live uh, near Stellwagen Bank, like uh, dolphins. There's many different types of dolphins and porpoises, but I'm willing to bet you've probably heard of some other very famous types of odontocetes. For example, what is this one? You probably have seen it before, at least on television the killer whale or orca. They have teeth and although they can get pretty big, they're really excellent hunters and they can grab their food one item at a time. Another great example of an odontocete might be this guy. Some of you may know the white whale. If you've ever uh, been to some aquarium, you might see them. They're called the beluga. Now, they're a little bit uh, too warm waters here for the beluga. The beluga really likes cold water. Um, so I've never actually seen one in the wild before, but I'm willing to bet a lot of you have heard of the beluga because isn't there a song? Somebody tell me about the song. It's baby beluga, right? I think so. So there's a, one more, and those of you who might be in high school or older, or if you're adults and you really enjoy reading, there's a very famous author named Herman Melville, and he wrote a story called Moby Dick. So this whale right here is um, an example of the whale from Moby Dick, and that is the sperm whale. So sperm whales are much larger than our killer whales and belugas, but if you look really closely right to the lower area of their mouth, this uh, jawbone right here does have on it some really beautiful and very, very strong teeth. So we're not going to uh, really focus on the odontocetes today but I did want to give everybody an opportunity to talk about them and think about them because they're really, really cool. Uh, but here in New England, where I like to go whale watching, we often see um, more regularly, we see some of the mysticity, some of the filter feeders. Um, so here's just an example right here. And this, isn't, this is not one of my pictures. I just want to make sure that's clear. I borrowed this from, um, the uh, NOAA website, who does a really great job with educating uh, people. That's um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, they're part of the US branch of government that deals a lot with all the cool sciencey things that are going on, like uh, fish surveys and whale surveys and learning more about the weather. And they have an incredible artist that works with them. His name is Uko Gorder. And he made every picture that you see here of all the common types of whales and dolphins that you might see uh, here where I live, uh, right by the Atlantic Ocean. So here's some examples. Um, all of our mysticetes that we see here, like the fin whale and the humpback whale, which I'm going to focus on today, they're my favorites. Uh, the minke whale and the say whale, like say it ain't so, say whale, um, are a common or known uh, mysticetes that we see. Another of our very favorites who uh, actually is considered a critically endangered whale is the North Atlantic right whale. And they are really strange looking whales. Um, there's none that are like them at all, but they are among our favorites too. There's actually not too many of these left, only a couple hundred left in the whole entire world. So they're critically endangered. And that's um, this animal right here, the North Atlantic right whale. Above, you may be able to see there are some toothed whales here, some of our dolphins that we see, I like the Atlantic white-sided dolphin, and our much smaller, cuter, and very shy harbor porpoises. So we're going to move beyond um, all of the different biodiversity, the many different types of whales and species that we see, and we're going to talk 
pretty much exclusively the rest of our talk today um, about the humpback whale, which happens to be one of my very favorite whales to watch. Um, one of the great things about humpback whales is that they can actually be tracked by their tail patterns or their fluke. So this is gonna be an important word that we're gonna talk about today, the fluke. If you've ever seen a picture of a fluke before or in the wild, I would love for you to, to make a shout out to um, ask in the chat um, about them or share a picture if you have them. And in fact, if you would like to share a picture from any whale watch or even a book that you have about flukes or whale tails, I'd love for you to share it on social media. And this is probably a good time to mention by now, you may have noticed in my slides, I've included a little hashtag in every single one of my slides. It's down here in the bottom that you can use. Um, it's NBTI Wales for National Biodiversity Teach in Wales. So if you decide to post anything on social media, feel free to use that tag and I will find you and we can talk about whales and I can make a response to anything that you decide that you would like to post there. So in the meantime, humpback whales, yes, they are amazing creatures and they're by far my local uh, favorite because they can be tracked by their tail patterns. We're gonna talk about that today. Um, they're also one of my favorite to talk about uh, with their scientific name because their scientific name is just so beautiful and so very long. You may see it here in the upper right-hand corner, Megaptera novangliae. So for any of you who may have ever studied word roots, or if you want to guess what Megaptera novangliae means, you can try to guess in the chat or let me know uh, on social media and see what you think. But no cheating. Don't look it up. See if you can break those words apart. Mega Terra and Nova Angliae. And at the end of this presentation, I will tell you uh, what it means. Okay. So the humpback whales, amazing, amazing animals. Um, they, uh, here on the uh, eastern seaboard, uh, make a yearly migration. Now, um, one of the things to note is and I probably should have mentioned this before, is that humpback whales are actually circumglobal. They exist in every uh, waterway, in all the oceans, in all the world. And there are actually many populations of them. Um, the number of populations is a little bit argued, but most uh, agree uh, between 14 and 16 uh, separate distinct populations of humpback whales. Um, but all across the planet, they look pretty similar with their sort of long elongated bodies, um, about 40 to 50 feet long. And one of their really telltale signs that makes them so well known are their long, long flippers or pectoral flippers uh, that extend from their shoulder joints. So this is a really great picture of that here. I know that these um, flippers are actually not above the water. That makes this picture even cooler because the humpback whale is, well, I like to say, in flight, but actually just uh, swimming with the um, flippers out, but you can still actually see those flippers. And the reason why is because there's lots and lots of plant life, what we call uh, plankton, that uh, glows green in our waters here in New England, because there's so many amazing rich nutrients here. We have a lot of plankton in the water. And the humpback whales that live in this area tend to have white or close to white flippers. And when they're underwater and they begin to swim up towards the surface, they actually almost glow. They fluoresce because they pick up the color of the plankton in the water. So it's a great way to tell that you're looking at a humpback whale because their flippers are so long and they almost glow green. What we love about the humpbacks and what we've learned about them is that they actually make this amazing journey. Every summer they come to Cape Cod and the surrounding waters and they come here to feed. That's explicitly why they come. They come north to feed in the cooler waters where the plankton is. And at the end of the summer season, when the water starts to get a little bit cold, they begin to think about making a journey back south again. And they end up in some really cool places like the Dominican Republic and Turks and Keiko. I'm actually really jealous of them because they get to spend their winter in a wonderful place. And those of you who are tuning in from Bermuda, I'd love to hear from you. What kind of whales do you see down there? And have you ever come across a humpback whale? Would love to know. 
So one of the other things that's super notable about humpback whales is that they, they're just incredibly curious creatures. And um, if any of you have ever tuned in to my other presentations uh, in the past for Nat Bio Teaching, you may know that whales have some great things about them. And there's also some pretty serious um, threats that they come across because they're so well known for their unbelievable behaviors, which means people often want to learn about them or see them in the water or approach them. And because they're so naturally curious of people um, in the water and in boats, they can sometimes get injured. So one of the things that I always like to make sure that I um, talk about a lot is that if you're going to spend any time at all in the water looking at whales, or to be honest, any wildlife at all, you want to do so really responsibly, uh, very carefully, and make sure that you know what you're getting into. So for example, uh, when I uh, take pictures like this on the boats that I work on or do research on, um, we are doing this uh, with a lot of careful consideration in how we move the boat around and uh, try to make sure we stay out of the whale's way because it's very important to give them space in their natural habitat especially so no one, including yourselves and the whales, uh, get hurt. But this is a really cool picture, isn't it? So another uh, amazing thing, so now we're really like, talking about behaviors, uh, humpback whales are known for, is they're known for their, their incredible feeding behaviors. And all across the world, they sort of pass down the knowledge from one generation of humpback whales to another to teach their young how to feed appropriately. So you, you saw, if you were looking in the little square where I am, you saw my humpback whale with its uh, big articulating or jointed jaw and the baleen on the inside that helps the whale um, to filter its food. Um, here's another great picture of humpback whales in action uh, trying to uh, gulp their food. And when they do this, they're expanding their throat like a bullfrog and ton of water is getting in there, hundreds of gallons of water, and they have to filter all this water out and hope that all the food or the prey item that they're going for stays in the side. Um, there's a lot of action happening here in this photo, um, and it's one of my one of my very favorites. I took it years ago um, uh, from the boat, the Cupola, out of uh, Sea Salt Charters in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and the whales on this day um, were feeding one of my favorite fish, uh, the herring. So uh, they're not any bigger than this. Uh, herring are pretty small fish. They're fatty fish and they're really, really excellent protein. So humpback whales just love to eat them. Even though those whales were feeding on herring at the time, the preferred food off of Cape Cod on Stellwagen Bank in that national marine sanctuary is actually a very skinny fish, no bigger than the size of a pencil. Um, you can see in someone's hand here is um, a fish we actually scooped right out of the water, um, the sand lance, the American sand lance. So these are actually an eel. And if you look in the background picture, you can see across the water how many of these fish can exist in just one small space. They group together in a big bait ball and swirl around together, trying to look very, very big so that they can be really scary looking and they'll hope that the humpback whales won't catch them that way. But when they do, it's actually really amazing. The humpback whales say, hmm, a very efficient bite. And they come up and scoop them all up as best they can. This is a great food that we have here on Stellwagen Bank. And there are scientists that dedicate their whole lives just studying the patterns and the density or like how many of the sand lands there are, because they're a really important food item uh, for the whales. And the whales depend on this a lot so that they can gain enough weight to make their migration or their journey back south every single year, but very small fishes. So if it were up to you and you were a humpback whale, I'd love to know how many fish a day would you think that you would want to eat? If somebody wants to go ahead and guess in the chat, I would love to hear from you. How many pounds of fish a day do you think a humpback whale needs to eat to not only survive, but also to thrive? Now it's kind of interesting these are very, very small bits of food. And eating one at a time would be like you eating one cornflake at a time or one grain of rice at a time. You really wanna eat a whole bunch at once. 
which is why our humpback whales are excellent filter feeders. They scoop up a whole lot of them, bucket loads at once. But what if the prey was even smaller? So for example, um, we talked about the right whale a little earlier. They have even longer and even bigger baleen than the humpback whales do. And they target an even more specific food source, which I'll bet if I hold a jar of this food source up to my camera, you probably can't even see it. Can you? Does anyone know what might be in my jar? This is a great example of a food source that my North Atlantic right whale loves to eat. Those are copepods, which is a type of plankton that you can almost barely see or hold in your hand. So if you were a North Atlantic right whale and you needed to gain tons and tons of weight, well, how much of that? do you think you would need to eat? It certainly would be a more than a handful, right? So you'd wanna be a very efficient and good filter feeder. So feeding is, it's a very interesting topic that scientists who work with these whales or study these whales, or even people like me who go and watch them and, and do a guiding tours on boats. Uh, we talk a lot about the, um, the feeding of the whales. And the reason why we do is because when the whales are up here in cooler New England waters, well, they spend a lot of their time feeding. So that's one of the favorite behaviors that we like to watch. We wanna make sure that our whales really do um, get all the food they need so that they can survive and make their journey south again. But that's not all. For those of you who have ever seen a Pacific Life insurance commercial or watched Free Willy, that's a real flashback to the 90s, or um, enjoyed any kind of really exciting whale behavior, I'm almost willing to guarantee that you likely heard about whale breaching. So there are many different kinds of marine life that do this. It's not exclusive to marine mammals like dolphins and porpoises and whales, although it's a very popular thing to think about them. There are other types of creatures in the ocean waters that also breach, even things like great white sharks, or the ocean sunfish also love to breach. And there's a lot of thought surrounding on why that might happen. It could be because the whales uh, wanna make a big noise and communicate with other whales. It could be because they're itchy and they're trying to scratch an itch. It could be because they've just fed and their belly's really full and maybe they just need to keep the food moving so they can uh, let go of the waste on the other end, if you know what I mean. Uh, but primarily, one of our favorite things to think, and we're really not sure yet exactly why whales do this breaching behavior where they propel themselves skyward and then rocket down onto the water, making the biggest splash. We really think it just looks like an awful lot of fun, which it certainly is. Now, you may often see pictures of whales engaging in this behavior, this breaching behavior. But on all of the uh, whale tours that I've ever gone on, uh, whether for research or for fun, which I, most of the pictures I took here were actually not um, when I was working. It was when I was just out on a day off having fun. Um, and uh, when I go out um, to provide commercial tours, you know, only about five to 10% of the trips that I take, of all the hundreds of trips that I've taken, only five to 10% of those, uh, you're gonna see a whale breaching. So even though it is something they love to do, you should consider yourself very, very lucky if you've ever been able to catch this behavior live. There's another really cool, really cool behavior. Um, and I was mentioning a why some of the whales, we think that the whales like to breach. Some similar thoughts about uh, this particular behavior. Now you're seeing a still of it right now, but that is one of those long flippers um, that we, we call our, um, the flipper extending from the shoulder, the pectoral flipper uh, up into the sky. Whales seem to, especially humpback whales, they seem to love to flipper slap. And again, we're not sure why, it could be because they're communicating or trying to get some itchy barnacles off, um, but we love to watch this behavior. So my hope was to be able to share this behavior with you. Of all the years I've done a presentation, I've never been able to embed a video, but I'm hoping that perhaps this will work. And if it doesn't, you'll still get the idea um, from the stills 
of the type of movement we're talking about. Um, this is a video I'm gonna go ahead and play. It's about 30 seconds long. You can just see the whale under the water, watch that flipper. And perhaps you can comment back because I can't really tell um, what you can see. I'd love to know if the video works for you. Feel free to throw in the chat um, if you're able to see the flipper happening. And you can even sometimes in this case, catch the whale's eye when it just comes above the water and now it's going to make a dive. But that's a very exciting behavior to see because the humpback whale flippers can uh, reach past a thousand pounds for each limb. And they are actually the longest appendage or limb, like arm or leg or tail, they're the longest appendage in the animal kingdom. Uh, so at the humpback whale flipper, again, um, is such a huge thing. It actually takes up about a third of the length of the body of the humpback whale, which is another great marker to tell who it is you're talking about. So I hope you were able to appreciate or at least see some of that video. If you weren't, um, so sorry. Uh, what I will do is I'll try to post some stills on social media later, but I'll hop right back into my slideshow. So we've looked at a couple of different kind of really awesome and fun and exciting types of uh, whale behaviors. Um, they're not all necessarily exclusive to humpbacks, but these are what the humpback whales are known for. So we've looked at, you know, some of the feeding methods and the breaching and the flipper slapping. But the one behavior that's so necessary and that is so important to scientists all around the world to, to learn about humpback whales is the fluking dive. Now, I mentioned earlier the, the whale tail, um, which you'll see everywhere. It's going to be on my necklace and it's going to be on my models. And in almost every one of my pictures, you're going to see this whale tail or the fluke. Um, every time a whale dives and lifts their tail out of the water, which is quite often, we call this a fluking dive because it shows us the tail of the whale. And we really like, we really anticipate uh, finding out about this tail because it has a very interesting pattern on the underside. So the fluke. This is the best way to recognize a humpback. And if you yourself know of any famous humpback whales, uh, I would love to hear who they are because lots and lots of them have names. They're actually so well known to some scientists who see the same whales time and again over the seasons, and they're well recognized, uh, that scientists actually take pictures of these whales and they put them into a special catalog that's just for humpback whale tails, and it allows us to track them and learn more about them. So many, not all, but many of our humpback whales uh, have names. Uh, these two whales, for example, are Dross and her 2021 calf. Now, looking at this picture, it's a little bit hard to appreciate because you have no scale for perspective, um, but I zoomed in from about a quarter of a mile away to take this picture, and the background whale tail, hopefully you can see my cursor, the background whale tail um, is about 16 feet wide from tip to tip, and uh, the, the tail in the front that's in the middle of diving, the fluking dive, um, that whale is the calf, which is significantly smaller than the mom. And this picture was taken when that calf was about seven months old uh, last July. So really cool to be able to see. And you can tell here because we have two whale tails side by side, not only is there a big difference between mom and baby or cow and calf, as we like to say about whales, uh, but you can also see that the underside of the tail so not the, not the top part that's dark, but the underside, uh, the ventral part, actually has a really unique pattern to it. So my goal for today was to be able to share with you some of my favorite recognizable patterns on humpback whales. So let's look. Now, I have to, to ask for forgiveness because not all of my pictures are going to be great. And in fact, many, many uh, whale biologists and naturalists like myself I take much better pictures and have much fancier cameras than I do. So that's the disclaimer. This one's a little bit fuzzy, but eruption is one of my favorite whales, a whale we've known for a long time that returns every summer to Stellwagen Bank. And if you look, there's a sort of typical pattern where it's sort of dark on the top and light on the bottom. And if you can imagine 
what um, the smoke coming out of a volcano might look like. It might look like all the smoky shadows from an eruption. So this whale long ago was named eruption and we use it to track the tail every year that we see them. Here's another example. For those of you who have studied sounds, you may know that an echo is when you put out a sound and you get the sound reflecting back at you. Echo, echo, echo. And uh, the mark that helps us to remember who echo is, another famous humpback whale, is right here. You can see sort of the, the picture of the noise reverberating back. So echo is a, a great example of a whale that's quite recognizable and very famous. And then here is one of my favorites. I actually showed you a picture of her already. If you can uh, recall, owl. Uh, she was the one that had the big open mouth with the, with the baleen. Uh, owl is a whale I've been following for decades, literally decades. And I'm willing to bet that most of you can guess how she got her name. If you look on either side of the fluke, over here there's one big dot, and over here there's one big dot. And in those dots, they kind of remind people of maybe an owl's eyes. So owl's very famous humpback whale. Uh, this is also a, a great time to point out another behavior of humpback whales. If you're able to appreciate the sort of dark brown spots right here. At the time that this picture was taken, uh, Owl was eliminating some of her food choices. She was making a bowel movement. She was defecating or simply pooping. And whales have to do that every day because they're eating hundreds and sometimes thousands of pounds of food. So an interesting photo, but also a very helpful one to find out what Owl herself is doing. So the flukes are so important uh, for humpback whales for us to be able to tell them apart and to be able to track them over time. And these catalogs are very carefully curated by scientists all across the world who share this information. But, but just like humans, they also have other different types of features that can help them um, be, be uh, differentiated or distinguished from one another. And that is the dorsal fin. So if you think about the dorsal side, that's like our backside, okay? And on our backside, when we're a whale, not always, but oftentimes there is a fin. So my, my model of my humpback whale isn't a really good example of it. They're sort of a very like nubbly, hardly there fin. But I put together a couple pictures of some of my um, favorite whales. Um, this one example down here is a, it was a whale named Music. And over here is a, a whale named Valley and some of these other whales. But what I wanted to do was to be able to point out five different examples of how the shape can really differ. And also the markings can really differ on the whales, even though they're mostly dark in color, uh, they can sometimes have um, special markings or shape. So for example, this one here is very hooked and pointy. And this one is also hooked, but not quite as pointy. And uh, this one and this one are sort of more triangular. And the dorsal fin on valley is honestly hardly there at all. So even if you don't get an opportunity to watch that whale do a fluking dive into the water, um, typically because they come to the surface to breathe, you can still uh, get a chance to see the dorsal fin. And if that's the case, you know anything about the whale, you might be able to compare one to another. So very, so very cool stuff. Um, there's another way that you can tell uh, whales apart. And I wanted to show it here with uh, one of my favorite whales. This is a whale named Pleats. Uh, Pleats for kind of obvious reasons. Pleats was named for her scars. So this is a humpback whale that was scarred, unfortunately, by a boat propeller where the propeller went into her skin. And thankfully it wasn't a mortal wound. She did heal from it. I wonder if salt water helps with healing injuries. Um, but what it did was it left behind some scars, like you can see here, the scars uh, that healed in and allow us to see who this whale is, the exact scars. Um, just like if you had a particular kind of freckle or scar in your body, um, you wouldn't need to see the whale's underside to be able to tell who this is. So one of the great things about tracking whales and learning about their scars and their dorsal fins, and hopefully also 
their flukes is that you, you get really amazing information by tracking them. And uh, most of that information right now is sort of beyond the scope of my uh, presentation to you today. But I do hope that, that some of you who are interested may wanna ask some questions about the kinds of things that we learn about whales. Uh, one of the greatest things that we learn about them is who is related to who. A little while ago, I showed you a picture of Dross and her young baby, her calf. Uh, so now that we've seen a picture of the tail of Dross's calf, we'll forever be able to match them together and know in the future, many years from now, that that particular baby whale, when it grows up, is the daughter or son of the whale named Dross because they were together um, feeding together and the baby was nursing from the mom. So a great way to tell who's who. And you can even build uh, family trees that way. There's many of them. Uh, you also can learn a little bit more about the life expectancy of whales because just like people, unfortunately, whales do die. But if they die and scientists are able to discover them and we know who the whale is, then we can at least get a sense of how long perhaps they've been around. You also get to learn more about uh, many behaviors of some whales even really like to do some of the same behaviors over and over again, or hang out with the same whales time and again, and we're established, uh, we establish uh, patterns or trends from not only the species, humpback whale, but sometimes also between individuals, um, like one whale I know uh, that loves to make really close approaches to boats is called Nile. And she's one of my favorites as well. And we'll often see her coming right up to boats. If we know she's around, we know we're gonna get a really great view. We also learn about the health of whales. So sometimes we see them looking really good and really fat. We want our whales to be very big and fat. Um, it means they have more fuel to make their journeys. Um, and we can tell from year to year, if we see the same individual again, that perhaps they're doing better one year than another. Um, or if they have a baby, we, if they have a baby, we know they're really healthy. If their skin's not looking so great or they look kind of skinny, we can tell that they're maybe not doing as well. Um, and we can also learn how many babies across uh, time that they've had. Um, for example, there's a very famous whale, probably the most famous whale in the world. Her dorsal fin is pictured here. And if you have uh, ever studied or read about humpback whales before, you may even know her. Her name is Salt. And to this day, um, she's had at least 15 known babies, and um, she has been studied since the 1970s. She's perhaps the most photographed whale in the world. And the reason why she was named as she is, is because it looks as if on the top of her dorsal fin that there's some salt sprinkled on top of it. So she's a really easily recognizable whale without looking at her tail. There is so much information you can learn about these whales. And of course, I know the point of having all the discussions around the national biodiversity teach-in is to um, be able to learn about the many different kinds of, of species that are out there and to really want to protect them. But one of the great things in focusing on the humpback whales today is to be able to give everybody out there an appreciation for the different kinds of diversity, even among one species to be able to see the different markings, the different body shapes, the different stories that they tell us from the past. And if we have a look into our past and a look into uh, what is kind of happening with these animals, it gives us something to really care about. And hopefully for our future to be able to not only learn more about them, but to really want to be inspired to save them. So. I'm going to end this presentation. And of course, I'll continue to um, chat with you if you'd like to learn a little bit more. If you have any questions in your chat, I'll be looking at them. Uh, but I'm gonna end this presentation with a challenge for you. Now, I realize that some of you are individuals out there who are just interested in learning about whales, uh, but teachers, I, I know that you've got classes with you, especially those fifth and sixth graders that I first saw coming in. And this might be a fun challenge to do. If you have some free time, or you're inspired to learn a little bit more about the whales, I'd love for you to get creative. So I'm offering everybody a whale tail challenge or the fluke challenge. You can make a splash with that by deciding on who your own whale is. If you have a favorite from my presentation, or if you would like to even just make up your own, design your own whale tail fluke. 
and share it with us. I would love to share with all of my audiences that like to learn about whales. Share your whale, your drawing, your cutout, um, even a, a digital representation. You can name it and then post it onto social media uh, like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And then you can tag hashtag NBTI whales. And if you do that, I will find you and I will share your, your own designed whale tail. And if you have questions about some of the whales that um, we discussed today, I'd be more than happy to answer them for you. So with that, thank you everyone for uh, joining me for Whale Tales here on Cape Cod. If you have questions or comments, I'm gonna be answering some over the next few minutes. Um, but if you don't yet, and maybe you wanna talk about it later, you can always reach out to me at lindsay.hurt at maritime.edu. Or if you're brave and you'd like to check out the Cape Cod waters and you live nearby, please, you are always invited to meet me on the water in Cape Cod uh, in summer 2022. So thank you everybody for that. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna check out um, some of what might be going on in the chat. I hope you're all able to see those pictures pretty well and maybe not the video, but one of the um, great things about um, sharing my pictures with you is that um, you know they're all very different. And I have to be honest in saying most of those pictures that I shared are, you know, they're from all different times that I've been on boats before. Um, many of them were taken on the sea salt charters boats out of Provincetown, but all of them were taken in a Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. So let's see, we've got some great comments here. Uh, Vanessa mentioned that she's seen some whales in Hawaii during the whale season, and that's phenomenal. Those are some of the best places. Also, another giant hotspot to see um, whales. They are actually a different population, same, same species, but different population of humpback whales that travel between Hawaii and Alaska. So if you're looking in that neck of the woods or that area of travel, um, those whales are traveling to Hawaii for their summer uh, and they're taking the colder waters in Alaska and using those as their feeding grounds. So really interesting and beautiful whales in that space. So I see, oh, Glenbrook fifth grade, nice to see you on here. Uh, so this is a really great question. Uh, we talk about, um, whales as marine mammals, but I don't think we actually reviewed what mammals are. Uh, so let's do that right now. Uh, Christopher mentioned that whales need oxygen from air. They definitely don't get it from water like how fish do. Did any of you notice that there happened to be a big blowhole on top of the whale's head? Well, here's my, my whale model. There's our blowhole. It actually has two holes, two holes, just like I have right here, two holes. All of the baleen whales or the mysticetes actually have two holes so that they can uh, breathe oxygen. And of course they can't do this underwater. So those two holes that make up the, um, the nostrils on the blowhole, they close right up from very, very powerful muscles while the whales are underwater. And then when they come up just above the water, if they poke their noses out, they can open those right up again and take a big breath. So all whales, dolphins, and porpoises uh, breathe through a blowhole. The mysticetes actually have two holes, but if you've ever seen any dolphins, either in the wild or maybe through flipper, you might notice that the dolphins and other odontocetes, the ones that have teeth, they only have one blowhole. So Nicole is, um, has her students with her and she is asking, what is my favorite type of whale? Well, I would, Really, really, really like to be able to say I have an exact favorite. I think my favorite ones to track are the humpback whales because there's so much to talk about. Um, but I've mentioned, I think a couple of times now that the North Atlantic right whales are so amazing and they're critically highly endangered um, because of some of the threats that they face like uh, boat propellers and um, ship strikes and entanglements in fishing gear. And I'm really pulling for uh, this particular whale. So I think those uh, might be my other favorites. And uh, Larry from the same class has asked, how many years have I been a scientist? And uh, that's a great question. 
I think that all of us begin as scientists when we start taking an interest in something and asking lots of questions. And if I recall, my first discussion of whales uh, with my mom and dad was when I was about three years old. And ever since the beginning of knowing that I could have a job someday, my hope and prayer was that I would be able to be a marine biologist to work with sea creatures. And so I'm gonna go ahead and say all my life. <laughs> my first whale watch was when I was five years old and I have been working um, exclusively on whale watch boats and giving educational uh, presentations since I was about 18 years old and I'm 37 now. So <laughs> for my middle-aged life, I guess I'll say, uh, a kind of a long time. I really, really love whales. And so that's why I was really happy to talk to you about them. Let's see what other comments we have here in the chat today. So our Bermuda friends say the humpbacks migrate past Bermuda between February and April. And they have a database of the whales as there are repeat visitors that have been documented through their flukes. Well, that's really interesting and similar information uh, as we have here uh, locally, uh, we have um, the Center for Coastal Studies that curates an unbelievable catalog known as the North Atlantic Humpback Whale Catalog. And these are all of the whales, the humpback whales that tend to use the space in their migration in the Gulf of Maine. That's our New England Atlantic waters. Um, so what the ones that they're talking about here in the chat are actually the ones that pass through Bermuda. And there's a Bermuda cetacean sightings project. I'd love to look more into that. And I will be liking that Facebook page later today. So some of you gave um, some answers about how many pounds we think a whale eats in just one day. So that's a, a great question. And it depends on the size of the animal. But some of our humpback whales um, can grow to the size of almost two school buses, um, 40 to maybe even 55 feet. And they can weigh 30 tons or more. They lose and gain significant amounts of weight each time they do a migration or go into a, a feeding cycle. Um, so our humpback whales over the summer can sometimes eat more than one ton of food or more a day. One ton is 2000 pounds of food. So that's, that's a lot. That's the equivalent of, I would say, at least 500 big giant uh, Chipotle burritos with extra guacamole, of course, or maybe about the same as 8,000 quarter pounders from McDonald's with extra cheese, of course. So a lot of calories, a lot of protein, and hopefully also a lot of fat. So another question I'm getting from Jessica Hamilton, do members of the same family have similar patterns on the flukes? And that's a great question. And one that's still being answered right now. The answer is, we think so. For example, there is a whale, maybe I'll just show you my larger fluke so that you can get a sense. So um, there is a whale who has, you're supposed to have on the dorsal side, more of a darker uh, sort of color. And on the underside or the ventral side of the fluke, it's usually lighter with a lot of dark spots on it. And that can vary from very white to very dark. There's all different kinds of patterns that you can see. Um, but one of my favorite whales to sort of track over time and her children is a whale named Ventisca, who all across the underside uh, of her fluke has what looks like very snowy pattern. Ventisca, as it turns out in Spanish, means lizard. So Ventisca has a very snowy pattern, not only on her tail, but also on her dorsal fin. As it turns out, uh, a couple of her offspring or baby whales that she has given birth to also have similar, not exactly the same, but similar patterns. We think that might be a skin condition. It's very hard to tell until you go right up to the whale and ask it some very, very personal questions. But it is thought that uh, some family members do have very similar patterns on their flukes and dorsal fins. But you see all kinds of dorsal fins that are so very different from each other. And not only in coloration, uh, but also in the shape. And we can just attribute that to some genetic differences. 
Another question that I see here is, do whales have triplets? And I was really, really hoping that somebody would ask this question. I get asked this question all the time on the Whale Watch boat. And the answer is, unfortunately, no. We would love to see um, animals that we want to increase their numbers of them in the wild populations. We'd love to see them have babies very fast. But let's just be honest, everybody. If you're 50 feet long and you're giving birth to something the size of a minivan, you probably only want to have one at a time, right? It's not easy for a whale to give birth. And it's a very energy expensive activity. It takes a long time to make a baby. And well, it takes a long time uh, to take care of it afterwards. So as far as we know, uh, there's really no evidence that whales give birth to more than one at a time. So there's some really, really great questions here. Uh, gosh, and I see that we're running down on time, but I would just absolutely love to answer more of these questions. I think I'm gonna get cut off soon though, if I keep going, uh, but I'm going to check out YouTube everybody um, and check out where you are. More questions, you can keep going. Oh, I do have a couple more minutes, that's great. Well then, yeah, you can awesome. Keep going. awesome. I've got a couple more here that I'd love to address. Um, so Ryan from Jennifer's class would love to know why the food that whales eat are so small since they are such large creatures. That is a great question and a little bit beyond the scope of this particular presentation. But we find that if whales get into spaces where there is a very dense amount of extremely yummy and very nutritious food, that they can corral that food and eat very, very large volumes of it. Uh, one thing that has really helped whales over the course of time in evolution is to be able to efficiently feed. So if they go after, um, especially, I mean, I'm talking about the filter feeders here. Um, if they are going after one fish at a time, it takes a lot of energy to try to get that food. So a great comparison would be if your grocery store uh, near where you live is 10 miles away and you don't have a car. If you have to walk to the grocery store every single day and you can't take your car with you to fill up your, um, your car with groceries, then you can only carry as much as you can handle, right? So you can only carry a little and you have to burn a lot of calories walking there. It's much more efficient for these large whales that are filter feeders to be able to gulp huge amounts of food at a time. And that way they can gain weight faster. And what they do, is they take that food and all those nutrients and all that fat and they turn it into blubber. So blubber is fat and that's those, all those amazing insulating layers around the whale that keep them nice and comfy and warm in cold waters and also provide for them a fuel tank. Basically lots of gas to let them go on their way. So they burn up those calories to, to move their bodies through the water because they have to travel great distances hundreds and sometimes even thousands of miles. So let's see. Oh, great question from Debbie. Besides whales, what marine animals are your favorite? And I would like to say that they all are. Uh, and one of the reasons why I participate in the National Biodiversity Teach-In in general is because I love the diversity of all types of animals um, in the whole world, from here to there and everywhere. My expertise is in the New England waters where I study the whales that come here. It's kind of convenient for me to step on a boat and be able to study those whales. Um, but there are many different kinds of marine life all over the planet. If you just simply compare uh, ecosystems, they're very, very different from the cold Arctic waters that uh, represent krill and blue whales and orca whales, all the way to the um, cool Caribbean waters where there's all kinds of coral reefs and interesting kinds of sharks and seahorses and uh, corals. It's really amazing how different and how numerous there are of many different types of of um, marine life, just so, so many, it's just fascinating. And the more that I learn about them, the more I don't know, the more I realize I don't know. And I hope that you find that too, as you ask questions and find things out, well, you, you kind of have more opportunity to learn. Um, so let's see, Violet is asking how much food does a baby whale eat? And that's a, that's a great question too. Also one of my favorites. 
I love that baby whales, when they start out in life, like many other mammals, they are drinking milk from their mother. So like all mammals, they have warm blood. Um, they give live birth. They breathe air through their lungs. And, and they, they also drink milk from their moms. So when they're first starting out, they're nursing every day for months and months and months. And instead of nursing out of a bottle, because that's not possible, the mom has to use some of that blubber in her body to make very, very large amounts of very fatty milk. It almost looks like curdled yogurt. It's really gross. But uh, baby whales drink that. And uh, they will often, the humpback whale anyway, will gain weight to the tune of about 100 pounds a day. <laughs> so that is an awful lot. Now, I'm going to go ahead and answer one more because I'm realizing I'm starting to get overtime here. Um, and yes, Bermuda, I would definitely offer virtual lessons in the summer when you have camps for sure. Um, but there was one that I wanted to end with. Ah, Nicole, thank you um, for having Liam ask, what is my very favorite whale watching experience? And I'm going to answer that in two ways. My overall favorite experience is the fact that I get to go out. I'm so lucky all summer long and enjoy whales. I'm employed by Captain John Boats uh, out of Plymouth, Massachusetts and Sea Salt Charters out of Provincetown, Massachusetts. But I'm also frequently invited on other whale watches. Uh, one in particular that, that just did an amazing job and showed me some incredible whales was the Seven Seas Whale Watch out of Gloucester, Massachusetts. And they are fantastic, or should I say, fantastic. That's what I should be saying. Um, I love that I get to go every single day um, whenever I can and enjoy whales off our coast all summer. So that's my very favorite. Um, but if I were thinking of one particular experience, uh, my very favorite whale in the whole world, I've already mentioned her, her name is Niall. And uh, each and every summer, every time I get an opportunity to see Niall, I just really love that because it brings me back to when I was five years old and I saw her first. So thank you everybody for all your questions. I'll try to get to some of them in social media as well. And uh, back to you at headquarters for NBTI. How's it going? Thank all right. Hello. Thank you so much for coming back to us and presenting about whales again. It was really fun learning about them. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the questions you guys sent in. Don't forget to check out hashtag MBTI whales. We really want to see everything you send in. And I know Lindsay will watch you too. But yes, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I'm really appreciative of your participation. And I hope to see some of you online with more questions later.